let me just say a few words of uh, background before I turn it over to Richard. Uh, you know, there are, I think, two of the most fundamental issues come together in this conference. Um, one is, do, do we understand the, these titanic underlying forces that are reshaping nations? You know, we, we tend to focus on, because we're such a now kind of a culture, we tend to look at the, you know, what's immediately on the headlines and, you know, maybe there's a, you know, a, a, a tsunami in Japan and it fundamentally changes the energy environment. I mean, there are big events like that. The one thing that's probably more fundamental than anything, and yet it gets very little attention in policy circles, are these profound demographic changes in the world. And they are huge. Uh, and then that's the first thing that we're looking at. But the second thing is even more important, and that is uh, our governments effective in addressing these problems. And now this is a, not the best time to raise that question in Washington. When you say, when you say <laughs> government effectiveness, it's kind of like you know, one of those you know, general intelligence kind of things. It's a contradiction in terms. You know? I mean, effective Washington right now is, a, is a, obviously a painful conundrum. We're in a woeful way. Uh, and it could be very damaging to us over time very damaging to us over time. So no one in America is going to be throwing rocks at anyone else about this fundamental problem. But it is a fundamental problem for everyone. And so the goal with this effort is to uh, create uh, an objective framework that everybody can look at. We may argue about specific pieces of it, but it's trying to be objective about this large problem and how well different countries are going to manage it. Obviously, if we can create an incentive for governments to become more efficient in handling such a fundamental problem, it'll be good for everybody. It'll be good for governments, it'll be good for society. So that's the, the purpose for this. Um, I would like to say special thanks to our friends at Prudential who have made this possible. Now Prudential, I always thought of Prudential was an American company. I didn't learn until this morning I was wrong, you know, and, uh, and so, but they do have an American outpost called Prudential, but it's a different Prudential. Uh, and their, their outpost here in the colonies, this is a British firm, their outpost here in the colonies is Jackson Life, and it's Jackson that's making this possible. But it's the underlying intellectual commitment that Prudential has had. They've been our partner on a number of projects that have made this possible, and I just would like to say a sincere thanks to you, Miles, and your team for, for giving us a chance to do this work and to bring it to the policy community in Washington. So and thank you all for coming. I'm glad you're here. Richard, you're going to start this for real. I'm, I'm simply color commentary until he got his notes together. Let me turn it to you. Very, very good. All right, turn it to you, Richard. Exactly. Um, thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Um, I'm delighted that uh, you could come today, despite or perhaps because of the government uh, shutdown, um, and uh, despite the uh, 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 despite the London weather, um, even though uh, we're in Washington. Uh, let me first um, introduce. Uh, Arup Banerjee, uh, who's the World Bank's Global Director for Social Protection and Labor. Um, I'm absolutely delighted uh, that he's able to take time out of his uh, schedule um, on uh, 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 this long weekend, of all long weekends, um, in order to join us here and uh, say a few words about the bank's work on aging preparedness. Um, let me turn it over to uh, let me turn it over to you. Thank you so much. It's, it's thank you, Richard. Um, thank you, everyone. And again, indeed, thank you for uh, sparing the time to come and talk to um, all of us and have this discussion uh, on this very important work uh, by Richard and colleagues here. Uh, I certainly have a reason to uh, be here beyond the fact that uh, I want to talk about, uh, as you said, what the bank, uh, World Bank is doing on this. Um, it's really because I feel that this is terribly important to me personally, given that I'm aging very rapidly. And 
by the end of this weekend, I would have aged a few more years, I think, uh, <laughs> given the fact that the, the annual meetings of the World Bank and IMF going on right now, which, from which I've uh, stolen a few minutes to come here. But uh, it is indeed uh, a great pleasure to be here today at the launch of the second round of the Global Aging Preparedness Index. For us in the World Bank, um, which, as you know, the primary objective that we try to serve is, and it's a renewal um, that we have made to ourselves, is to try and end global poverty and to boost um, the incomes of the most disadvantaged in society, the bottom 40% in society. And aging brings challenges to these that are fundamental um, in terms of how to make sure that old age and disability due to old age does not actually contribute greatly towards ending poverty and to make sure that people aren't impoverished by the challenges that comes through aging. So because of that, the World Bank has long recognized the sort of multifaceted aspects of global aging. Now, aging, of course, will affect all countries in the world, um, even the countries that think and I've been to some of them over the last week who think that they're quite young uh, and therefore they don't need to worry about these things. But for the World Bank, it all really, our interest in this work really started with the engagement in the early 1990s with the countries of Eastern Europe and the former Soviet Union. This was the time of the transition and there it was quickly evident that the combination of a group of countries that had fairly extensive social systems to deal with aging, but for many of them were getting old before they became rich, was one of the central challenges of the era, of the time. And so the World Bank began at that time to devote significant both intellectual and financial um, resources to this challenge. And that led to, almost 20 years ago to the, uh, to the month, um, the launch of a major report, which was called uh, Averting the Old Age Crisis. It's a very ironic uh, title, if you think about it, as we stand here today. It was called Averting the Old Age Crisis. So 20 years ago, we were going to avert it. Um, and let's, uh, we'll, in my remarks, I'll actually try and see whether we have. Uh, you may know the answer. Um, but averting uh, the old age crisis documented at that time the problems with existing pension systems across the world, including especially this focus on um, the emerging and developing and transition countries, and laid out a framework for looking at uh, pension systems in particular, supported by analysis and data. And that led really, as many of you know, to the basis of the World Bank Group's engagement with dozens of countries um, over, the last, uh, over the next few years. And it was both in terms of policy advice, um, in terms of financial support, but also an investment in the generation of knowledge. Um, we have learned a lot since then. Um, that was a first mark, and as many of you know and have been friends and contributors to the debate, um, we have evolved in our thinking. The basic framework, I think, still exists uh, and is valid, but we have refined it very much since uh, in the face of new challenges. Uh, for myself, um, my involvement with this issue came with uh, a book that I co-authored again on the aging crisis uh, in Eastern Europe and the former Soviet Union. Um, it was rather fancifully titled From Red to Grey, um, and looking at how the former communist and former socialist countries were aging fast. And the challenges that even six years ago we put forward are things that um, we still, I think, haven't found answers to. When you have, we have eminent dem demographers like John Mayer. <laughs> so if we have countries such as Ukraine or Bulgaria, which between 2010 and 2025 are going to lose between 20% to 30% of their population, entire populations, 
while having a fairly generous set of pay-go transfers in, the, in terms of the pensions, you have a sustainability issue that is uh, a real challenge and something that countries have not, these countries have not been able to tackle yet, partly because of the political cost. So I hope that part of the, our discussion will not just be on this fantastic um, index that uh, Richard and colleagues have developed, but also on what this, how can this index actually lead to sustainable solutions. Aging, of course, does not affect just the pensions part of the issue. It affects labor markets, it affects growth, it affects uh, spending on health care, it frees up perhaps spending from education, um, and these are all aspects that we looked at in the book, and I think part of the challenge is actually to look at how we have helped countries and worked with countries to make the sorts of changes in the entire economic structures that are needed when countries are aging. Now, finally, um, thinking about, I've talked a lot about Eastern Europe and Central Asia, partly because that's where some of my work uh, has concentrated. But today I lead a team, and Robert Palacios uh, is part of that team and leads the pensions work there that looks at these challenges globally, not just in Eastern Europe and uh, Central Asia. Um, we are working today uh, quite closely with China, the largest country in the world and one of the countries that is trying to grapple with how to deal with the consequences of rapid aging. Um, next year, we will produce a major report on East Asia um, which is indeed the fast now, today, the fastest aging uh, region in the world. The oldest region may be Eastern Europe, but the fastest aging is indeed East Asia. There's another book due out uh, in a few months on pension coverage in Latin America. But last week, I was in Southern Africa in countries like Lesotho and Botswana and Namibia, as well as South Africa. And it is clear that policymakers there have not actually um, quite realized that if you look at their demographic profiles, they are aging as well, despite these huge, the, the population pyramid is biased towards the young, but the shape is changing quite fast. And the decisions that they are making today are going to be very important about whether there's sustainability. So again, looking at indices such as this, one of the hopes that I have is that these will serve as early warning systems for countries that actually can make the changes that are needed today without actually butting up against a crisis that they'll need to avert. Um, because, to state the obvious, the old age crisis has not been averted despite the World Bank, and I wonder, <laughs> you know, we clearly have not done our job well. Uh, finally, Richard, uh, I really want to congratulate uh, and welcome the work that has been done um, on the Global Aging Preparedness Index. It very much complements what we are trying to do with our countries, and it, I think, is a major contribution to the global discussion around um, aging and its consequences. The two particular points that I'd like to highlight here. First, and this is, I think, core to the issue, that for in this intensely political space of aging-related policies, this encourages the use of data and evidence to understand where countries are with respect to the aging process. And that is, as I pointed out with the example of the Southern African countries, a very important way to sort of have a wake-up call in terms of what countries are able to do in terms of their sustainability and adequacy of their, their old age uh, income protection. But secondly, um, it actually, by raising awareness of the aging challenge in terms of an index,
it fosters a sort of healthy competition, I hope, among countries um, by looking at how policies that they have right now increase or decrease their ability to cope with population aging. And that sort of competition is, I think, where we too can partner by using this index in terms of the dialogue that we have um, with these countries. We really would want to underline, and I would really like to underline, the eminent need for evidence-based policymaking in this area. Because again, without this, it really becomes a debate and a power play among different interest groups in society on how best to design the policies. This puts, casts a little flashlight into this. Now, that being said, I'm sure the panelists, and since they are essentially um, discussants, will point out that there are lots of ways in which um, this could be done otherwise. There are debates about the indicators themselves, how adequacy should be measured, how sustainability should be measured. We are facing similar challenges. Um, we are, at the World Bank, also trying to figure out how we can make our work focus on results and outcomes. And this debate is healthy. But by putting it out there, Richard, what you're doing is saying, this is our version of the way we look at the world. If you have a better one, come up with it. And I think that's a good, good thing to, to do. And I think that's probably the best way to do that. And this is also, I said, a healthy competition among countries. It's also a healthy competition among thinkers in this area to say, if you can do better, please do so. Um, finally, I want to underline the point that what, this, what I mentioned about raising awareness. We have to, I think, we all of us who are interested in these issues have to go beyond um, the rhetoric and make sure that the broader audience, the public at large, is well informed by information that is presented in a way that is accessible that quickly synthesizes this complex topic. And that's really the, the way that I see this report contributing to the, to the debate. Um, this is a complex issue. It's not something that's unidimensional, even if sometimes it's reduced to that. And therefore, putting this data out there, I think, is a huge contribution. And finally, if it does, as I hope it will, generate a debate some pushback, some controversy where countries may or may not like where they are in the rankings, where they uh, may disagree with the methodology and challenge this, um, that's all to the good. Because that means that there's more attention being played, paid to an issue, which I certainly consider and the World Bank considers as one of the defining challenges for the next few decades. So once again, congratulations. Um, and I look forward to the discussion, and thank you very much for having me here. Uh, Arup, thank you very much for that. Uh, my name is Miles Selleck. Uh, I am responsible for thought leadership issues at Prudential PLC. Uh, as uh, John Hamray uh, outlined earlier, that's not Prudential Financial, uh, before any lawyers start getting twitchy. Um, uh, we operate in the United States under the, uh, under the brand Jackson National Life, um, and uh, I'd like to apologize, having flown in yesterday from London, for bringing the weather with me. Uh, I was, uh, was right. In fact, actually, the weather in London was better than this. I was, if I brought it with me, you could, be, you could thank me. But but um, uh, thank you, Arup, for those, uh, for those comments. I'd just like to say a few words um, and introduce the panel uh, that will be uh, having the discussion, leading the discussion with, uh, with you in the audience uh, in a few uh, moments' time. We've been working with Richard Jackson and CSIS on ageing issues for nearly five years now. Uh, so uh, I can remember very uh, clearly the launch of the first edition uh, of the Global Aging Preparedness Index uh, and the excitement uh, that that created, uh, the, uh, the impact that that had, the response that that had. It was the first time uh, that somebody had gathered together 
uh, uh, an overarching view of the challenges of fiscal sustainability um, and the broader policy challenges facing uh, aging societies in 20 key uh, markets um, and to have done so uh, in the context of the financial crisis uh, that was taking place at the time. Uh, the response was really quite phenomenal. I mean, certainly from, from my perspective and from the perspective of Prudential, uh, it was beyond what we could have dreamed uh, of. So the uh, interest that was generated in Washington, but not just in Washington, in London, uh, in Brussels and elsewhere, was I think a real tribute uh, to the, uh, the work uh, uh, that was done by Richard and his colleagues. Uh, and we're very much uh, looking forward to continuing that debate, because as Arup has said, uh, nobody in this area has all the answers. Um, and I think the best that we can hope for uh, is that we encourage the right questions to be asked and in encouraging those questions and looking at those questions uh, that we have a dialogue uh, that can deal with the policy challenges that in many ways are common uh, across uh, so many of these countries uh, but that often uh, demonstrate themselves in individual ways uh, in each country. Uh, so we'll be having, uh, having that discussion uh, shortly. Um, what will happen uh, for the rest of the, uh, of the panel is in a few moments, uh, Richard will come up uh, and uh, run through a presentation uh, highlighting the key elements of the uh, second edition uh, and some of the, uh, I think, very rich data and very rich findings that, that have come out of that. Uh, we will then open up to a panel discussion, uh, which will begin with a response from Benedict Clemens, um, who is Division Chief Expenditure in the Policy Division at the IMF, uh, who will then be followed by Sandy McKenzie, Consulting Economist and Editor of the Journal of Retirement, uh, and Robert Palacios, uh, Pensions Team Leader in the Social Protection Team at the World Bank. And I'd just like to say that I'm delighted to have such a distinguished expert panel uh, with us to discuss this today. Um, so I won't speak for very long. Each of the uh, panelists will be strictly limited to 10 minutes, uh, so I will be uh, guillotining, except for Richard, except for Richard. Um, uh, that, uh, that exemption has been carved out good and early. Uh, but I will be guillotining everybody else ruthlessly at 10 minutes um, uh, with the threat of more London weather uh, if, they, uh, if they don't stick to time. Uh, so with that, we'll now have a short video uh, presentation uh, and then a few words from Richard. Thank you. The world stands on the threshold of a stunning demographic transformation. By 2030, the number of Americans aged 65 and over will nearly double. By 2040, more than one in three adults in Germany, Italy, and Japan will be retirees. By 2050, there will be a hundred million Chinese over age 80, and more South Koreans may be turning 90 each year than being born. Global aging will transform everything from the shape of the family to the shape of the geopolitical order. Along the way, it will challenge society's ability to provide a decent standard of living for the old without imposing a crushing burden on the young. Which countries are most prepared to meet the challenge? Which countries and which are least prepared? The CSIS Global Aging Preparedness Index provides the first comprehensive assessment of how well countries are balancing the two dimensions of aging preparedness, fiscal sustainability, and income adequacy. There's good news and, and bad adequacy. news. There's the bad news is that bad very few countries do well on both dimensions. Most developed countries have adequate retirement systems, but without reform, many may leave younger generations a destructive legacy of rising tax burdens runaway debt and diminished economic opportunity. Most emerging markets have fiscally sustainable retirement systems, but with informal family support networks weakening, many may face a humanitarian aging crisis unless they strengthen formal retirement provision. With far-sighted policy choices, it is possible to provide the old the security that they have earned while ensuring the young the future of economic opportunity they deserve. Some countries are making these choices. Australia, Canada, Chile, and Sweden 
all score well on both fiscal sustainability and income adequacy. But most countries are failing to meet the challenge. There is still time for them to change course, but the clock is ticking. To learn more about the Global Aging Preparedness Index, to learn more about visit gapindex.csis.org. Gapindex the world stands on the threshold of a stunning... Well, I... Is this on? I find myself in the difficult uh, position of um, uh, following my own, my own video. Uh, so I, I, I racked my brains um, last night and this morning trying to think of, you know, a, a creative new different way to begin uh, the presentation than the way I began it in the video. Uh, uh, and in the end, I decided just to begin exactly the same way. The world stands on the threshold of a stunning demographic transformation. You know, for most of human history, the elderly, um, defined in the gap index as adults age 60 and over, comprised just a tiny fraction of the population, never more than 5% until well into the Industrial Revolution of the 19th century. Um, in today's developed countries, the elderly make up about 20% of the population. By 2040, that share is on track to reach 30%, and that's just the average. In Japan and the fastest aging European countries, it could be approaching or even passing 40%. Now the developing world as a whole is still much younger, but it too is aging, with some countries traversing the entire demographic distance from young and growing to old and stagnant or declining at a breathtaking pace. By 2040, Brazil, I forgot I have a PowerPoint presentation <laughs> here. By 2040, Brazil will be nearly as old as the United States, and China will be considerably older. Meanwhile, South Korea will be vying with Spain, Italy, Germany, and Japan for the title of oldest country on Earth. You know, 10 or 15 years ago, or, or 20 years ago, uh, on the eve of the publication of Averting the Old Age Crisis, the global aging issue, re really, the global aging challenge barely registered as a, as a policy issue. Um, but today, it's a growing preoccupation uh, of policymakers, business leaders, and even the broad public in countries around the world. In, in the developed world, much of this concern um, has centered on reducing the growing burden that old age benefit systems threaten to impose on the young. I mean, most developed countries, after all, have universal pay-as-you-go state pension systems that were put in place back in the early post-war era um, when workers were abundant and retirees were scarce. Um, but that are now being rendered increasingly unsustainable by the rapid aging of their populations. Um, graying also means paying more for health care because the elderly consume at least three times more per capita in medical services than the non-elderly um, and at least ten times more per capita in long-term care services. So faced with this daunting fiscal arithmetic, Several developed countries, including France, Germany, Italy, Japan, Sweden, and Spain, have enacted deep prospective reductions in the generosity of the public pension benefits that future retirees can expect to receive. Many are also beginning to raise retirement ages, extend work lives, and expand funded pension systems to take pressure off government budgets 
and to help fill in the gap in elderly income um, that will emerge as state retirement provision is scaled back. The focus of concern in the developing world is often just the opposite. Although the rising cost of government old age benefit systems does pose a major challenge in a few countries, um, Brazil uh, and South Korea leap to mind, most emerging markets are aging before they've had time to put in place the full social protections of a modern welfare state. Here the central problem is not so much the growing burden of the old on the young, uh, but the growing vulnerability of the old. In countries like China, India, and Mexico, only a fraction of the workforce is earning a pension benefit um, um, through any formal retirement system, public or private. Uh, the elderly still rely heavily on the extended family for support, yet informal family support networks are weakening um, um, uh, and are under stress from the forces of modernization uh, and will soon come, soon come under intense new demographic pressure as populations age and family size shrinks. In response, many countries are rushing to expand participation in formal contributory retirement systems and also to strengthen non-contributory floors of government old age protect, poverty protection. Yet despite the growing concern, um, I am allowed a slight overstatement. No, I think so. Uh, despite the growing concern, until recently, there existed no satisfactory measure of how effectively different countries are actually responding to the global aging challenge. Um, and the purpose of the Global Aging Preparedness Index, now in its second edition, uh, is to fill that gap. The Global Aging Preparedness Index is based on a long-term projection model developed by CSIS that tracks trends in total government benefit spending um, and total household income by age. Uh, the projections extend through the year 2040 in order to capture the full impact of the demographic transformation now sweeping the world. Um, the index covers 20 countries, including most major developed economies, as well as a selection of emerging markets for which adequate data was available. Um, there are actually two parts to the index. There's a fiscal sustainability index and an income adequacy index. On the fiscal side, uh, we begin by looking at projections of uh, the total uh, pay-as-you-go transfer burden uh, of benefits to the elderly, but we don't stop there. We also look at the fiscal room that countries have to accommodate their growing old age dependency burdens by raising taxes, by cutting other spending, or by borrowing. Um, in addition, um, we consider the degree of dependence of the elderly on government benefits, um, which we think is a reasonable proxy for potential political resistance uh, to cost-saving reform, um, um, or indeed resistance to actually following through and implementing reforms that are already in the pipeline in many countries. On the fiscal, on the, excuse me, on the adequacy side, um, we look at uh, projections um, of the after-tax income of the elderly relative to the non-elderly. Um, we also include indicators that measure the extent of elder poverty in each country, as well as the strength of family support networks, um, which are a mainstay of old age security uh, still in some emerging markets, in many emerging markets, as well as some developed countries. Now, this being an index, um, I initially thought that I would proceed sequentially through each of the indicators um, and explain how they were calculated uh, and what they imply. Um, but unfortunately, uh, or perhaps fortunately, depending on your perspective, um, I don't have time to do that. Uh, so in, instead, um, I'm going to focus on a few of the top-line findings uh, 
um, and along the way uh, uh, highlight uh, a few of the indicators that I, that I consider most revealing. I think what's most striking, um, what's most striking about, I should have a pointer here, what's most striking about the index, or at least one of the things that's most striking, is, is that, uh, uh, as was already said in the video, very few countries do well on both dimensions. Um, three of the s top seven countries on fiscal sustainability, uh, India, Mexico, and Russia, are among the bottom seven on income adequacy. Um, and three of the top seven on income adequacy, the Netherlands, Brazil, and Germany, are among the bottom seven on fiscal sustainability. So there appears to be um, a worrisome trade-off uh, between the two. Uh, countries are either buying sustainability at the expense of adequacy or adequacy at the expense of sustainability. Um, there are also a few countries that fail to score well on either dimension uh, of global aging preparedness. Uh, France, Italy, and Spain um, are among the bottom five countries on fiscal sustainability yet despite heavy spending on old age benefits, barely rise to the middle of the income adequacy index. Um, and then you have uh, Japan, which scores in the bottom tier of countries on both indices. Um, what all of these countries have in common is that they've enacted deep reductions in the generosity of public benefit systems while failing to put in place adequate alternative sources uh, of, of income support to fill in the resulting gap in elderly income. Um, despite these reductions, though, they still have such expensive old age benefit systems and or are aging so rapidly that they remain on a fiscally unsustainable course. In short, um, they're in the unenviable position of moving towards retirement systems that are both, unsus that, that are both inadequate and unaffordable. Uh, not surprisingly, the emerging markets tend to score better um, on uh, fiscal sustainability than the developed countries do. Most start out today with much lower um, public old age benefit burdens, both because they have, they're demographically younger um, and because their public benefit systems uh, are typically far from universal. Uh, Poland and Russia, um, which have developed world age profiles uh, and, and universal, though less than generous, uh, welfare states are exceptions. So is Brazil, which despite its youthful demographics, um, spends lavishly uh, on public pensions, in fact, uh, more than many developed countries do. Uh, e even, even so, um, E e even so, and despite the fact that public benefits to the elderly are projected to go, grow rapidly in some countries, some emerging markets, roughly doubling as a share of GDP in Brazil, roughly tripling uh, in China, and nearly quadrupling um, in South Korea, uh, at, at, at the end of our projection horizon in 2040, only one emerging market, Brazil, uh, is among the top 10 highest burden countries. And the developed countries spend more uh, today and are projected to spend more in the future, but obviously um, um, there, there's a considerable range of outcomes there as well with the United States and the other Anglo-Saxon countries um, at the low end uh, of the spectrum in Japan uh, and the continental European countries at the higher end. At turning to income adequacy, uh, we see just the opposite picture, um, with the developed countries scoring, uh, uh, for the most part, um, at the top of the rankings, and most of the emerging markets scoring toward the bottom of the rankings. Um, in, 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 in fact, in several developed countries, the per capita uh, ratio um, of median after-tax elderly to non-elderly income is actually more than one to one. Um, and in all of them, it's over uh, uh, 0.75 to 1. Um, the relatively poor performance of the elderly um, uh, uh, on, on this adequacy measure in most emerging markets is, of course, due in part to the limited reach uh, 
and or low replacement rates of their formal retirement systems. Um, but there's also a, a, a sort of deeper backstory here. Um, economic development itself plays a role in the economic marginalization of the elderly, since rapid wage growth, the, the rapid, wa rapid wage growth that accompanies development um, boosts the economic fortunes of the young relative to the old. Uh, it's the young who have the skills, um, it's the young uh, who earn higher wages. Um, and it's no accident that the two emerging markets that do score well uh, uh, in, 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 in terms of the relative living standard of the elderly are both in Latin Amer America where slow growth and entrenched inequality uh, tend to tilt the age distribution of income the other way. Um, in, in the case of Brazil, uh, the outcome is also due in part um, to its lavish spending uh, on public pensions. Now, I, I need to be aware that I, though, though I'm taking the privilege of speaking longer, I don't have unlimited time. I, I, I did want to uh, say at least a few words um, about how countries uh, can pay for um, their uh, rising old age benefit burdens. I mean, it, just a projection that shows that, that pension spending um, or, or total old age benefit spending, including health care, is going to rise substantially as a share of GDP doesn't in and of itself mean that, that, that the system is unsustainable. You, you have to also take into account the fiscal room that countries have um, um, to accommodate uh, that growth, either by raising taxes, uh, by cutting other spending, or by borrowing. Um, um, on the tax option, suffice it to say, uh, uh, that most countries would end up with uh, considerably higher tax burdens by 2040 than they have today, uh, including some traditionally low tax countries uh, like uh, Japan, Switzerland, and the United States. Um, some developed countries might, in fact, not be able economically uh, to raise the tax take enough to pay for the full cost of their age waves. I mean, push it, pushing taxes past 50 percent of GDP uh, uh, is quite, quite a feat uh, accomplished only by one or two countries thus far. Um, the emerging markets would appear to have an advantage, um, but that advantage may be more apparent than real, because remember, uh, most have large informal sectors that by definition can't be taxed. Um, um, they may have, a Brazil or a South Korea uh, may have trouble pushing the tax burden past 40 percent of GDP. I will uh, vault over the uh, 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 cutting other spending option, the cannibalize the rest of the budget option, um, um, except to note that, that some of the countries which do very poorly on tax room, you know, take a Sweden, do very well on what we call budget room. Um, um, and the, the, the implication being that if you're spending 50 percent of GDP, through, through channeling that through the public sector, presumably there's some lower priority spending somewhere that you could cut to make room for the rising cost of old age benefits. And then um, the IMF specialty, uh, uh, borrowing room. Um, I, I include this uh, because you know, you, you, it's a set of corner solutions. Th th those are the three ways you can accommodate uh, a rising old age dependency burden. But this one for most countries is largely theoretical. You know, except in a Sweden or a Chile or an Australia, Mexico, Russia maybe, um, um, where the initial net debt level starts out very low, or, or in some cases uh, 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 it's a question of net assets, not net debt and the projected growth in benefit spending is also low. Well, sure, maybe uh, you could finance the age wave by borrowing. Um, in, in China, perhaps, as well, not, although benefits are projected to grow very rapidly as a share of GDP, economic growth is very rapid, too. Uh, so, so borrowing may be an option. May be an option. But in most countries, uh, that, that would be a ruinous uh, 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 choice. The markets would call the experiment to a halt uh, long before the debt burden reaches the levels projected for the Netherlands, the U.S., much less Japan or Spain. And I, I, I shudder to think at the dire warnings that would be, that would be issued uh, uh, by the IMF. Um, 
So in the end, the bottom line is that most countries are going to have to make substantial reductions in the generosity um, of their old age benefit systems. Um, but as they do so, they're likely to face intense resistance uh, to reform from aging electorates, half of whom um, by the 2030s will be age 50 or over in Japan and most European countries. Um, and this resistance is entirely understandable. In the first place, the elderly in most countries are highly dependent on public benefits. Even in the United States, with its vaunted tradition of financial self-reliance, 40% of the income of the median elder comes in the form of a government check. In many European countries, it's 60%, 70%, or even 80%. Um, when I say median, I'm talking about the third quintile of the elderly income distribution. And not surprisingly, many of the countries that have the highest levels of benefit dependence are, of course, the countries that most need to cut benefits. In the second place, many countries, as I mentioned earlier, already have large cuts um, in relative benefit levels built in uh, to their current law. Um, and many countries, we project, um, will experience uh, a flat or declining trend in the relative living standard of the elderly in the future. Um, so you have aging electorates, high benefit dependence, um, and a decline in the relative living standard uh, of, 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 of the elderly. Now, we need some good news in the story, right? Okay. There, 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 are, um, there are some countries uh, that, that seem to be doing um, a fairly credible job uh, of balancing income sustainability, uh, 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 I'm sorry, income adequacy and fiscal sustainability. The, the high performers tend to have modest pay-as-you-go state pension systems, which helps to ensure sustainability, and large funded pension systems and high rates of elderly labor force participation, um, which helps to ensure income adequacy. Uh, Australia, um, sort of uniquely among developed countries, combines a fairly generous uh, and robust means-tested uh, state pension benefit um, with a large uh, and mandatory funded pension system. Um, Chile, uh, at least since its landmark 2008 reform, where it, it introduced a non-contributory uh, social pension called the Solidarity Pension to underpin its personal account system. Uh, this is part of the World Bank's evolving thinking on the issue also, I believe. Um, um, it, it, Ch Chile now has a similar mix of retirement policies. Canada does rather well on both indices. I might, I might, I might add that the United States would have um, had not its uh, the, the, the huge run-up in its public debt and, of course, its extraordinary uh, rate of growth in, in per capita health care spending pulled it down uh, uh, in the fiscal sustainability index. The, the, the outlier here, or the odd, the odd country out, is Sweden. I mean, Sweden has a very large pay-as-you-go uh, uh, state pension system, a very large uh, a welfare state, and Sweden, like Italy, France, uh, Japan, um, and a number of other countries, uh, uh, has enacted very deep cuts uh, in the future generosity of that system. It's, it's tra transitioning it from a, a traditional defined benefit to a notional defined contribution system. But, but Sweden, unlike these other countries, is, is actually projected in our index to maintain uh, income adequacy by increasing labor force participation and by increasing funded pension savings. Um, I, I would add that this, this contrast between Sweden uh, uh, you know, and the France's and Italy's um, uh, 
re really points to a crucial, crucial lesson. And, and, and that's that you, you can't have adequacy without, you, you, you can't have sustainability without adequacy any more than you can have adequacy without sustainability. Um, most developed countries, as well as some emerging markets, will have to make substantial reductions uh, in the future generosity of benefits. But unless they put something uh, in its place, um, these reforms may turn out not just to be socially inadequate, uh, but to be politically unsustainable. Um, and, and, and in deference to uh, uh, the project sponsor, let me cite the UK as an example. Um, any country that thinks it can divorce the two dimensions of aging preparedness should look at what happened in the UK. Um, back in uh, uh, the Thatcher era, uh, they re-indexed um, their state pension uh, from wages to prices. Um, many uh, policy analysts, uh, myself included, I can see one or two others in the audience, uh, uh, you know, hailed this reform for its fiscal probity. Uh, but, but as um, um, time went on, and of course, benefits declined relative to wages, that's what happens in a price index system, um, the concern shifted from fiscal sustainability to income adequacy. Um, there, there was a hue and a cry as people began to realize that they were impoverishing the future elderly. So they reversed course and re-indexed re -indexed the system to wages. You know, so now the UK scores much better on adequacy than it would have 10 years ago, but it scores much worse on sustainability. Miles, do I have two or three minutes to, to wrap up here? Two or three minutes to wrap up, yes. Okay, good. Um, I should, since this is the second edition, uh, at least say a few words about what's changed since the first edition. Um, and I wish I could report that there's been enormous progress on all fronts in most countries, uh, but unfortunately, um, um, that's not the case. Uh, I, I think the best we can say um, is that it's, it's a mixed picture. I mean, ver very few countries in our projections have actually reduced, uh, made additional reductions in their long-term uh, uh, old age benefit burden um, um, beyond those they had made when the first edition came out. Uh, and the failure to do that is, is, is worrisome um, because the fiscal room that countries have to accommodate their rising old age dependency burdens ha has narrowed dramatically as the economic and financial uh, crisis has, has, has unfolded. Um, most of the country rankings uh, are, are similar, though there are a few stories, uh, noteworthy stories uh, worth calling attention to. Uh, Japan sinks like a stone in the fiscal sustainability index. No country has burnt up more fiscal room um, probably over the past uh, five years than, 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 than Japan has. Um, Poland sinks like a stone, uh, minus seven, um, from 13 to 20 on the income adequacy index. Even as other countries um, are uh, strengthening uh, funded pension systems, Poland is busy dismantling its system. Um, meanwhile, uh, China uh, rises five places on the income adequacy index. Uh, thanks uh, in large part to the government's ambitious efforts to expand pension coverage to um, uh, migrant and rural workers. Uh, France and Italy uh, also um, um, rise substantially on the income adequacy index, but, but, but here, uh, having done my doctoral research in Italy and having a French wife, uh, I, re I regret to say that this is not so much due to any absolute uh, improvement of their own, uh, but rather to the relative decline. Uh, this is a relative index uh, uh, of, of, other, of other countries. Um, so the, the, encourag the encouraging news, uh, uh, such as it is, um, is, is that we, ha we, we, we have seen over the past decade um, a a uh, strong increase in elderly labor force participation uh, in many countries, particularly in Europe, that have traditionally had very early retirement ages. Um, we, we, we do also see uh, uh, from, you know, from South Korea with its new corporate pensions uh, to the UK with its uh, nest pension, 
um, China with its enterprise annuities. Um, um, in countries around the world, we do see, uh, 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 with only a few exceptions, um, an increased emphasis on funded pension provision. Um, and in fact, uh, in all of the gap index countries, uh, uh, funded pension benefits uh, as a share of elderly income are projected to be at least as high, uh, and in some cases substantially higher in 2040 than they were in the, in, in the last edition. Um, and elderly labor force participation, high, higher labor force participation and funded pension savings um, w within our framework, and other people uh, may have different analytical frameworks, um, but are particularly important for two reasons. And, and, and that is that unless somebody knows some <coughs> magic way to increase the rate of technological <coughs> progress and, and productivity growth, they, they really are the only two ways that you can, um, in an aging society, uh, maintain or improve the living standard of the elderly without imposing a new tax burden or family burden on the young. Uh, and a as, as, as my con concluding point, I, I would like to sort of turn that around and say, but, but there are limits to that. Okay, f 60 may be the new 40, but 80 is not going to be the new 60. Um, we're not going to work forever, um, and many of us will outlive our savings. The, what you're looking at here is the per capita ratio of the after-tax income uh, of the old elderly, 70 and over, to the young elderly, 60 to 69. Um, um, the young elderly are much more affluent than the old elderly, mainly because they have alternative sources uh, of income support. The old elderly are far more dependent on, on public benefits. In recent decades, um, Life spans have increased, health spans have increased, the threshold of any functional definition of old age has drifted steadily upward, yet in almost every country, huge rivers of public benefits still flow to adults in their early and mid-60s who in most countries are in effect middle-aged. Um, in the end, you're not going to be able to balance fiscal sustainability and income adequacy um, unless you rethink the role of the state in retirement provision itself. Uh, uh, not so much as a floor on which to build um, the other tiers, but more of as a backstop um, against uh, longevity risk, uh, against inability to work, um, against outliving one's savings in true old age. So I probably spoke too long. Let me stop. Thank you. Thanks very much. Richard. Uh, and I'd like to invite David Clements uh, to give the first response. Thank you. Okay. Let me see what which PowerPoint is. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Thank you very much. Um, so I will attempt to stick within my uh, 10 minutes of time and uh, see what time it is. Okay. Uh, well, thank you for inviting me. I, I think this is a, we, at the IMF, we've been very happy to see this report come out and also the attention uh, put on these issues because one of our main uh, concerns uh, looking forward has been the coming fiscal challenge from age-related spending and even uh, after we get through the, say, present difficulties of many countries and the fiscal positions, we see this uh, as an important, uh, important challenge. Uh, let's see. No, this. All right. Uh, all right. Okay. Okay. My overall comment is that just a few uh, overarching comments on the, the report and the indexes. We find this a, really a, a useful set of indicators. Uh, for analyzing uh, fiscal sustainability, the adequacy, and the need for room reform. So we really like this report, especially from the standpoint of the adequacy indicators, which you think uh, it really it's hard to come up with good adequacy indicators. Um, but we found, that in, in also, and also we'll go into this, in some cases our projections, the IMF, of say the fiscal pressure coming from age-related spending 
are a little bit different, and uh, we think it would be useful for the report to spend more time just talking about uh, the methodology and how wide, what the drivers of spending are, and how projection, why projections have changed between the reports. Uh, sometimes we, we thought that the individual indicators are much more useful than the index because it's always difficult to decide what weight to give to these different sub-indices. Um, and finally, then it, it's sometimes difficult to interpret these ranks from a policy perspective in terms of, okay, what does this mean for uh, what policy reforms need to be done? But this is more minor comments from the, uh, in the sense of looking overall, finding this report uh, very useful. What I want to do now is just talk a bit about uh, what's really behind some of our comments and why we at the IMF see these age-related spending as such a big challenge. I mean, what we've been looking at is, uh, if we look at pension spending, if our own projections for the next 30 years is on average in these countries, spending is going to go up about two percentage points of GDP. But you can see that the challenge differs quite a bit. This is in terms of looking at countries' underlying projections uh, that they submit, say, for the European countries, for the aging report, and also some of our own projections. And in some countries, pension spending is projected to come down. You can see those, as Richard mentioned, that have done a lot of uh, reforms, reducing the generosity of benefits, such as Poland. You can see a large projected decline in some countries, like Italy, that have taken reforms uh, lately. The increase in spending is going to be a lot uh, lower than, in, than the average. But where we, and, and something I would suggest a report might emphasize going forward is the challenge from health care spending. We still see this as even more difficult than controlling pension spending. Here, I mean, our average then is, for the gap countries, is three percentage points of GDP. And you can look, for example, at the United States, what a large uh, ch challenge this is going to be. Now, we are looking at age-related, this is at all health care spending, public health care spending. But you can see, for example, in the United States, this is really dwarfs a lot of the uh, questions about pension spending. We project, and similar to the CBO, between now, for example, and uh, 2030, alone healthcare spending is projected to go up about four and three quarters percent of GDP. So large increases are coming down the pike for healthcare spending, and this really, I think, is what threatens to squeeze out room for even uh, insuring against old age poverty. So we see this as one of the uh, big fiscal challenges. Now, if we kind of compare this, the uh, the uh, the gap projections for spending for the elderly with what we are calling this age-related spending, we can see that in most cases they are uh, uh, there's a correlation here, but there are some differences uh, in terms of where the purple with this the CSIS uh, increases, for example, in Poland are much higher than uh, what we are we are expecting. So. It may be useful at some point in time to just uh, compare notes on this. The differences, what are the differences and assumptions about healthcare spending? Yeah. yeah, and I noticed that with the CIS, I think your project methodology assumes some slowdown in healthcare spending, some convergence to the mean. But from our standpoint, without any policy change, healthcare spending will cont continue to increase. There has been a slowdown in healthcare spending the last couple of years, but some of this recent work we've done shows a lot of that's related to the economic cycle that healthcare spending tends to slow down during recessions, but as economies recover, there's no reason, and there haven't really been fundamental changes in healthcare systems, spending will continue to rise. Uh, kind of confirming uh, Richard's general point of who has more fiscal room and who doesn't, if you just look at from our April uh, projections, it's a lot of ways is simply related to debt levels. Debt in the advanced countries is much higher than in the emerging economies, and that seems to be the general story. Also, when we look at the uh, at the sustainability, the indices is it's a, qu a story of debt. Um, if we kind of compare, let's say, the gap report estimates of uh, fiscal room and what we in the IMF been looking at is illustrative fiscal adjustment needs, you can see there is some uh, positive correlation, but there's also a bunch of countries where, kind of like you look in the middle here, that where we are indicating they need a lot more, uh, uh, that they don't do too well from a sustainability standpoint. This is a measure we are, for the advanced countries, we, we do an exercise of what would they have to do between now and 2030 
in order to get their public debt down to, say, 60 percentage points of GDP, so more of a, a safer, more prudent level. And you can see one story here is that there's almost everyone needs to take a large fiscal adjustment. If you look there, four, six, eight percentage points of GDP. Um, this also f factors in the increases in age-related spending. So this is, you can see, the enormous challenges that uh, Japan has in terms of its uh, the expected increase in health and pension spending plus how much fiscal adjustment they would need. For the emerging economies, we take a lower threshold of 40 percent. But the story is that many countries are going to have difficulty then accommodating aging and, and protecting the, the elderly if they also want to bring debt down to a more uh, sustainable level. Now, in terms of uh, the key issues, perhaps for the next gap report, uh, and a challenge we're seeing many countries that Richard alluded to is dealing with lower replacement rates. We've seen a lot of the pension systems are going to become more sustainable in the future, but that's because they're replacing in a generosity in replacement rates. Average pension divided by the average wage, that's going down. Um, the problem with uniform reductions in replacement rates lead to a uh, higher old age poverty. Let me show you this. I mean, some work we were doing just in looking at historical experience of what happens when countries cut replacement rates and, el and poverty amongst the elderly. So historically, this has happened that uh, cutting replacement rates, which a lot of countries are planning on doing, has raised poverty. Now, that can be avoided if you change the, uh, the uh, uh, protect the uh, replacement rate for the lower income workers. But then that uh, has as some drawbacks because if you say look at our second bullet but if you protect those replacement rates at the bottom you're going to really compress the benefit uh, the uh, generosity benefits for those who have contributed above that level and you're really harming incentives to contribute more and more we see the pension systems being converted in this way to almost more of a social assistance program so it's not really about consumption smoothing anymore it's just about protecting old age poverty a big challenge also is what are the best options for countries that have weak pension coverage but also other public expenditure needs, so, so countries that need to spend more on health and education uh, and infrastructure in order to catch up. Okay. So if I look maybe a more uh, indicative here is looking at coverage and replacement rates in 2030, what we predict, especially in the countries that as Richard is talking about, India, China, Mexico, Korea, they have very small share of the population being covered, but they also have very low adequacy. So these countries you see as a, a special challenges uh, to both uh, to make sure that the elderly do not fall in poverty. Okay, so just in summary, um, we s agree and containing this age-related spending is really one of the major fiscal challenges uh, going forward, and the advanced countries, they need to do this just to bring debt back to sust uh, sustainable and prudent levels, and for the developing countries, the big challenge is how do I provide also space for other high quality spending, such as in uh, education and infrastructure. And this decline we're seeing in, in replacement rates, it's going to erode uh, adequacy. And our key questions are what happens to poverty if we cut pensions across the board? Uh, but if we don't do that, what happens to incentives if we predict protect minimum pensions. Now Richard mentioned one way forward, and this is what we really uh, agree on, is increasing retirement ages and increasing labor force participation then of the elderly. It's, there's really no way out of this without the elderly work, uh, workers having a longer work lives. Some increases in uh, statutory pension ages have not kept up with increases in life expectancies. And the only way out of this is to uh, raise working uh, the uh, raise, raise the number of years people work. Um, Richard also mentioned that uh, the role of uh, private pensions can play, but one of the big challenges we're seeing across countries is the private pension systems have had relatively high administrative costs, and that's causing a huge pushback, exceptionally, say, in Eastern Europe, about whether or not this is the right thing to do. So I think a very big challenge is how do you provide uh, private pensions or just private savings vehicles at a reasonable cost. So I'll conclude with that. Thank you.
First of all, let me say uh, it's a real pleasure to be back at CIS uh, participating in a discussion of the GAP project. This is my second go at it. Um, I cannot fail to be uh, just greatly impressed by the tremendous amount of work that has gone into this, not simply into the calculations, although the work going into calculations must have been prodigious, but in the way uh, the authors have very carefully gleamed the important facts and institutional developments uh, from the experiences of the uh, 20 countries that are featured. Um, I generally agree <coughs> with the report's policy prescriptions, uh, in particular the obvious vulnerability of the elderly in emerging market countries and the growing fiscal burden in the G10 countries or industrial countries in general. Um, one thing I really like about the report and have liked about the project is the effort to marry uh, some uh, indicators of uh, income adequacy and fiscal sustainability. I think in many ways that's what makes the report uh, unique. Um, my report, sorry, my comments will focus mainly on the report's discussion of the lessons for uh, policy to promote retirement security. Uh, I will, however, make a few comments on the technical side of the report. Um, I also want to discuss the report's findings for the United States, which is the country I now know best, having left the IMF some seven years ago. I might make a remark or two about Brazil as well. Um, just one general comment about the index. It, it, it seems to me that the GAP index is best at uh, showing us where countries are going, so to speak. Uh, and, and therefore, uh, where perhaps uh, uh, intervention is most necessary. Uh, I don't think it is backward looking. It doesn't show what a country has done, although I suppose comparisons, if this were to become a regular event, you could make these kinds of comparisons. Um, all in all, I would describe the report as a, as a wake up call and a very effective wake up call. Um, getting to the main points. Um, uh, an increase in the role of funded systems achieves nothing as far as retirement security is concerned if the saving it generates comes totally at the expense of other saving. This is obviously recognized by the report. Um, and uh, the report also recognizes that saving done through funded schemes like the Australian super and the German race to pensions is more likely to be positive on a net basis, not just a gross basis than savings done through voluntary savings plans like the IRA in the United States. Uh, with such schemes, of course, as we know, the most generous fiscal incentives are enjoyed by those who really need them the least. Uh, I would, however, like it if Richard, when he uh, gets a chance, could say a little bit more about the net gross question. Is it possible to be more, uh, not precise, but more definite, I guess, about the positive impact on saving. And it really is absolutely essential. The only way you reduce the burden of aging on the young, aside from increasing the uh, uh, rate of labor force participation, is to give the current working generation more capital. If you don't do that, then you haven't achieved very much. Now, extending working life, the report places a great deal of emphasis on the importance, basically, of raising the rates of labor force participation of older people. Um, I agree completely that this has got to be an essential part of uh, a policy aimed at mitigating the burden that aging, aging can cause. That said, um, uh, I think it's important to recognize that implementing such a policy is easier said than done. And if you look at a country like the United States, it's probably, uh, probably among all the countries in the world, I suspect, certainly among the industrialized countries, the one where increasing rates of labor force participation among the elderly would be, I think, most readily achieved. Um, but it's not going to be easy. Uh, some economists have argued that older workers will need to accept a decline in their pay because they were underpaid earlier in their career, they're overpaid at the end, and to keep them on will require a declining pay. Uh, at the same time, uh, you know, old age discrimination, and I, I don't know if my views on this are influenced by the five years I spent at the Public Policy Institute of AARP, but uh, old age discrimination is not a myth, and although in this country there's a law against it, an employer really has to be stupid 
to be caught out in this particular area. You can basically let people go because they're old without, you know, without saying as much. You can find a good and plausible reason for letting them go. Um, interesting, I'll just say this. Uh, some years ago, the, uh, a former employee of AARP uh, launched a lawsuit uh, charging age discrimination, and I, I don't know how it ended. Um, another important issue is basically ensuring that, that the skills of workers do not atrophy uh, as they get older. Perhaps some sort of lifetime uh, learning contact, contract is necessary, uh, or the, the kind of continuing education programs that the Society of Actuaries fosters in this country, and that's one I'm familiar with, and, 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 and undoubtedly others. Um, Another issue that arises and I think is overlooked is the risk of disability. Older workers are far more prone to disability, not simply accidents on the job, but uh, disabling disease and illness. This rises with age, uh, but typically older workers, particularly they're self-employed, do not have disability insurance. It can be hard to get or very expensive, and it's something to bear in mind. Uh, the Society of Actuaries commissions surveys periodically uh, asking the retired uh, whether they expect to be working in their older years, and inevitably the, uh, the percentage who uh, respond positively saying they're going to, yes, be working is substantially higher than the uh, people, uh, percentage of people who actually do work. The other issue I'd make uh, about this, I don't want to get too, too microeconomic, but you know, we're all familiar with the slogan about living uh, longer, healthier. And I think that's true for many, probably most of the people in this room. It's not true for everybody. And many people who uh, are not, strictly speaking, disabled are basically barely hanging on to their job and basically praying uh, for, uh, you know, the calendar to, uh, to uh, uh, bring their 65th birthday or whatever it is, or even 62nd birthday so they can claim social insurance. And raising, if there are going to be general raises in the uh, minimum retirement age, I think the lot of these people needs to be considered, perhaps by reconsidering the uh, policy of disability. This is obviously a, an issue for I industrial countries with the bu bureaucracies that can deal with it, but it is an issue. Um, just finally, and again with respect to the United States, it happens that older workers have, a, that is workers aged 55, 65, have a younger, sorry, lower uh, unemployment rate than do uh, the, the average, than does the average worker in the labor force. But when they lose their job, they can be looking at a job search of over 50 weeks. It's just a sign of the difficulties that older workers can, can face. Um, turning to the more general issue, I'd, I don't quite recognize the portrait of the United States that the uh, GAP index uh, uh, gives us. Um, you know, the U.S. gets a high ranking under the income adequacy uh, uh, index. I think it's number two. Um, there is a view, and uh, I'm sorry, uh, my colleague Sarah may well disagree, but there's, let's say, there are many economists who argue that the country is facing a retirement crisis for a large number of reasons. Um, I'm not absolutely sure about this myself. Uh, however, um, Social Security is a great institution and an adequate first pillar, but its replacement rate does drop off pretty rapidly once income hits the, the middle ranges. Um, the coverage of the second tier is, at any given time, no more than about 50 percent of the labor force. Um, third, though, God knows huge sums are invested in 401k plans and IRAs. The median holdings of older Americans are not that high and wouldn't generate a very high sustained income. Um, I'd go on and say that uh, OSD has started to run a deficit and something will have to give, but I suppose that's covered by the fiscal sustainability calculations in effect. Finally, I, I can't resist, I mean, the gap is really about, in a sense, technical problems or institutional impediments, I think, to, to old age security. But look at the political dimension and look at the United States at the moment. I mean, whatever its numbers are, the fact is, is that this country has a hell of a lot of difficulty with reform. And it's not something, I, I, I'm not, I don't think this is a shortcoming of the report so much as just an observation one has to make. 
that, that you know, there is this additional dimension that's not captured by these numbers. A country can be in a real mess and muster the political will to do something about it, and it can be in, you know, a moderate mess, but not muster that political will. Um, on a related point, uh, just a point on interpreting one particular sub-index, um, uh, the gap assumes that a country with a low ratio of revenue to GDP is in effect in a better space or better place than a country with a high ratio. But you can also turn that around and say that the low ratio indicates a political inability to raise revenues to fund, uh, while the high ratio, as in a place like Sweden, indicates that there is a general social consensus. So again, these things are hard to interpret. Uh, the Fiscal Sustainability Index uh, gives Brazil uh, a, a low rank uh, and a number of 30, but it nonetheless places it above France at 23 and Germany at 12. Um, leaving aside France, would, would the bond markets agree with, with that relative ranking of, of Germany and Brazil? Do the bond markets have a 30 year time horizon? Uh, well, that's a good question. I'd, I'd merely point out that one, one you know, one way of measuring or getting it, one indicator of fiscal sustainability basically is the rate of interest at which a country has to borrow. Um, okay, on just a couple specific and technical points and I'll finish. The income disparity between the young elderly and the old elderly. Um, part of the reason for that may be simply that the elderly are following a strategy of decumulation. Their expenditures uh, may be sustained uh, but, but uh, or rather, their income is not a good reflection of uh, their sustainable level of expenditure. Uh, I should say that I've seen a study of the United States that says the decumulation of older Americans is, is in fact not that significant, but I think it's still a potential issue. The other thing is the, the, the report sort of uh, I would say it wrings its hands, but is concerned about declining share of the old elderly in, in elderly income as a total. And I, I'm not sure that that's such an issue. I mean, if, if more people are working, uh, sorry, more people uh, age 60, 65 are working, is that a social issue or a social problem to be concerned with? The income of the old elderly isn't affected. It just happens that the young elderly are earning more. Uh, and more, more generally, if the ratio of the income of the elderly as a whole to the labor force will decline if there's a sudden boost in productivity in the economy that's reflected in wages. But again, it's not like the elderly are being immiserated. And I, I think I've raised this point the last time I was here. So uh, if there is a problem, just let me say, of declining income over the course of re retirement, one potential way of dealing with it is through the uh, social insurance system. You could, you could offer uh, retiring workers a deal whereby in return for a modest decline in their pension, they would have a, a higher level uh, of, uh, of uh, income at, if they survive to age 80. Uh, something like this was advanced by John Turner in an article that's going to come out in the second issue of the Journal of Retirement, which, which I edit. But uh, all in all, and I'll stop here, I, uh, I think it's a great report and I hope it gets a lot of good publicity. Thank you. Thank you. Um, first of all, thanks uh, to Richard uh, for inviting me uh, to participate in this. Uh, I want to, as Arup uh, is walking out, um, reiterate the points that he mentioned, um, namely that um, that we're very happy uh, about CAPI um, because of this use of evidence and, the, and basing the, the global aging discussion on evidence. And, and trying to put in some objective indicators to, to these important concepts. And we are very much in agreement with the conceptual framework of, uh, as relate to uh, sustainability and ad adequacy. 
Uh, we would only add that when we deal, as we do, with uh, many developing countries, and particularly low-income countries, in addition to sustainability and adequacy, we look quite a bit at coverage rates because these are, in many ways, going to determine adequacy going forward and, and to a certain extent, sustainability as well. Um, and I'll come back to this uh, question of, power of, of coverage. Um, I can't help, I wasn't going to mention this because I'm going to try and focus my comments more on the income adequ adequacy indicator uh, to complement my colleague uh, Ben at the uh, fund who uh, focused a lot on sustainability. But one thing I will point out, Ben, is that the issue with the administrative costs is one issue with the funded schemes, but a, a, a bigger issue in my mind and what's happening in Eastern Europe has to do with the fiscal accounting. Um, the poor fiscal accounting practices that we have uh, for pensions are leading governments to essentially grab money in funded accounts to make their uh, their, their accounts uh, currently look better when in fact uh, from a, the perspective of the long term they're making their, their systems more unsustainable and this is something where we would really welcome the funds leadership to try to establish that kind of methodology to create the standards for fiscal reporting that would give a more honest picture of what's happening with the pension system as is now uh, gradually very slowly happening with the EU which is coming up with some standards for reporting unfunded pension liabilities so that's my one little comment on unfunded pension liabilities. I wasn't going to get into it, but um, and I'll try for the rest of my presentation to be a little more complimentary um, uh, in terms of the topic that we're going to cover. So I, I, again, I congratulate you on, on this. It's a very useful set of indicators that contributes to the international debate. And I think we at the bank uh, need to do more of this multi-sectoral approach, working with our health colleagues in particular on looking at the aging issue. And so we're learning from you in that sense. I, in what I'm going to say next, uh, I'm going to divide my comments into sort of two categories. One is some, some notes, some observations on the income adequacy index, and second on uh, some of the lessons that you highlight in the last uh, section of the report. Um, and I'm going to focus on uh, what I think is our comparative advantage, which is on the low income and middle income countries, uh, developing countries. There are eight uh, of these in your you call them emerging countries in, in the report. I've worked in four of them, and I know the at least the pension systems and the other four very well. So I'm going to make some comments uh, along those lines. Um, now, starting with the income adequacy in index. Now, the report highlights the and uses as an indicator co-residence rates, namely elderly living with uh, other family members. And we've been doing some research on this recently. We've built a data set of some 50 plus countries, and this shows the relationship between the income per capita of the country and the co-residence rates. So it's very, very dramatically clear that uh, poor countries have much higher co-residence rates and vice versa. Um, and this, I'm going to make the case, is an important uh, point uh, for the index, not just because it's one of the indicators in the index, but because of the indirect effects it has on some of the other uh, parts of the income adequacy index calculation. Um, within countries, you can also see if we break it down by quintiles that co-residence rates are higher among the lower income people. So this is nothing surprising. I think we would have intuitively expected co-residence rates of the elderly, elderly to live with their families more in sub-Saharan Africa and in sub-Saharan Africa among the poor, this, we would expect this to be uh, uh, higher as well. Um, but this has, uh, I think, uh, an interesting effect on looking at the income adequacy index calculation. Well, before I get to that, there's quite a, a lot of literature on the sensitivity of these comparisons of elderly poverty rates to non-elderly poverty rates uh, adjusting for equivalent scales. Um, and these equivalent scales can be in terms of the composition of the household. Uh, if there are more children, you may weigh them less in the calculation or in terms of economies of scale of the household. And so when we started looking at this, and we've just started, uh, by the way, we start to see that there are, th that these results are quite sensitive. So uh, the, uh, this is a little bit difficult to interpret, I'm sorry, but um, if you look at the, um, using economies of scale, uh, where we assume that half of the consumption is shared, we move from a situation where the elderly, con the countries where the elderly are richest is about two-thirds of the, of the countries to a case where they're about 
Um, this is just a, a very indicative. I've, we've got quite a few other uh, slides of this, but I don't have time to go into it. But w what we're going to look at, I think, is how sensitive the, um, the, the ratio of elderly to non-elderly incomes and elderly to non-elderly poverty rates are in these countries. And I think we'll find that in some cases, Brazil, for example, which we've looked at quite a lot because it's, it's always an outlier, um, Brazil is very robust. I can change equivalent scales and really they still come out uh, ranked uh, where you have them and where I have them. Um, but in some marginal cases, there, there are going to be qu uh, questions as to whether that ranking may change at the margin if you use different equivalent scales. And so we want to be, because the income adequacy index depends quite heavily on the ratio of elderly income to non-elderly income, to elderly poverty, to non-elderly poverty, uh, these, these things uh, may be important to look a little more deeply at. And it won't, if this effect was the same across all countries, then we wouldn't worry about it. But it, because there are different household sizes in poorer countries, because there are more higher co-residence rates in poorer countries, I don't expect that the effect will be the same across the countries. So, by the way, this is all also coming from the point of view of wanting to expand the sample of countries that is covered by the, the index. And we are now getting to the position where, at least for the income adequacy index, we could be in a position to expand the number of countries that are, that are where this indicator uh, would exist. Now, I did a little exercise um, for, my, for fun, uh, which was to compare uh, the CSIS indicators um, with the GAPI indicators with what HelpAge has recently done, uh, which has a, uh, which is another index, um, which has one component which is income specific. And it's quite interesting to see that the, the ordering is of the first two columns is really very similar. Um, and I know why, because I've paid attention to both of them. Um, but it's very interesting that they came out in the same way. Now, I made my own uh, ranking in the third column, which is based on a combination of... Um, From worst to be worst to best? Sorry, so I've taken the, the eight countries. Yeah, so the, 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 this is the best. Brazil is the best. Right. Sorry, I should have said that. It's not labeled or anything. It's from, <laughs> it's from worst to best in terms of adequacy, only for the eight countries, emerging countries, that are covered within the 20 countries of the index. Um, so uh, what, what struck me as and having spent a lot of time and thought a lot about India over the years was the Indian case, that India came out so high in both of these, uh, these, these studies. I, in my ranking, and I can explain to you, it's a combination of intuition and some actual uh, hard numbers underneath it, um, but for, for my unpublished ranking, India would come in last. And that's not because, uh, you might suspect I'm looking at it from the absolute levels of, of, of in income. That's not the reason. It's also not because I think that equivalent scales would, would have this effect. The reason I think that this is uh, the case is because uh, we had done a paper some years ago, uh, myself and a co-author, on poverty among the elderly in India. And what we found was evidence that there was a, an important relationship between income and mortality rates of the elderly. And so when we get these results that show that the elderly are relatively n not so poor relative to the non-elderly, we have to think about what's driving that. And it turns out, it, at least our uh, case that we tried to make to a certain extent, was that part of it is that they're dead. Uh, they, they don't survive. The poor elderly die faster by a very large uh, percentage than the, than the rich elderly. And this is going to come back to our, our question about the old, old and, and the young old in a second. Um, so I, I, the poverty numbers in India among the elderly and their income numbers for the elderly in the India really are, are being affected, I think, by this mortality differential, which which really should not be interpreted as the, the elderly are better off. In fact, they're just not surviving to be counted in the poverty numbers. In fact, the counterintuitive result is if you were to help and make the system more adequate for the elderly in India, you would see poverty rates among the elderly rise and the average income among the elderly fall because now they would be there to be counted. So th this is a particular issue, but it's going to be something that we, I would expect to see in many low-income countries. So that brings us to some other considerations for low-income countries, uh, moving beyond just the, the question of the adequacy index. So as I said, 
we're, we're very focused, uh, particularly these days, and I was there at the beginning of the averting the old age crisis, and at the time I do would say that this, the focus was very much on sustainability. We still care a lot about sustainability, but the focus has to a large extent changed in many places to a question of, of coverage and, and adequacy. Coverage is, is, is part of the story. The low-income countries uh, have fewer than one in five people covered by a contributory pension scheme. Um, so, and, and of course it rises, but even in, in transition socialist economies at the bottom, uh, we're seeing a r rapid fall in the coverage, particularly in the, the stands of former Soviet Union and so on. So contributory pension scheme coverage um, is, is really falling quite a lot. Um, this shows the relationship between income per capita and and coverage and contributory pension schemes. So it's a very close fit. There are, there are no countries that have managed to miraculously jump above their income level uh, in terms of coverage of contributory schemes. And so as a result, and, and I think the report does say this and, and, and includes one of, his, one of its recommendations, strengthening the safety nets for the elderly. And um, I think that's a very good thing to say. For me, uh, part of what I, I see in the, in the last section of the report is that the recommendations and the policy lessons that are coming out are much more focused to the uh, richer countries and, and the advanced countries. And I'll come back to that in a second. But one of the issues is this coverage rate. Um, and so what is happening is the frustration after 50 years of not being able to expand uh, pension and health insurance coverage, by the way, in social insurance schemes, that frustration has led to a dramatic shift in the book that's coming out in, on Latin America uh, next month from the World Bank documents this shift uh, to general revenue financed, uh, either what we call social pensions and in many cases financing of the premium, health insurance premium of the poor. And this is a, a phenomenon that's beyond Latin America. I worked in this uh, area in, in India where the health insurance scheme for the poor was set up, financed out of general revenues. Um, and this is a, a growing trend to stop relying so much on payroll tax financing period. Basically give up on this idea that the formal social insurance model is ever going to cover all of these folks. And, and China is another example of, of, of that. And within uh, the income distribution, if we look at quintiles, you can see that uh, there's a very strong relationship between the coverage of contributory schemes and income level. So in, in India, in the bottom two quintiles, basically nobody is covered in contributory pension schemes. Now this graph tells, takes into account the non-contributory pension coverage. So here you see that the relationship is much less uh, correlated that income level is, is not nearly as related to this ratio of beneficiaries of pension schemes to, uh, to the population that's over 65. Um, so th what we're seeing is that countries are choosing, like you know, Bolivia would, would be one example, a low-income country with 10% coverage in the contributory pension scheme, but 100% coverage through its non-contributory pension scheme. So, Yes, I agree that uh, based on the evidence that they're showing and the cases of Sweden um, and, and some of the industrial countries, yes, there is a need to extend the working lives. I also, subject to the caveats um, uh, that Sandy mentioned, think that increased pre-funding of pensions in the right way, done in, in, in a bright way, um, that actually does increase net savings, um, can contribute, obviously, to um, to maintaining adequacy while still maintaining sustainability, and I think that some of what's being undone in Eastern Europe is unfortunate for exactly that reason. And and this concentration on the older old, I think that may, has some uh, makes sense in the, in the industrial country context. But on the other hand, these are really middle and high and rich uh, country recommendations for me, where you have contribu contributory schemes with high coverage and more financial and financial markets that are more developed, but basically where you're relying on contributory schemes uh, much more. Um, but this is being questioned in, 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 the, in the lower income countries, and I, and I think the, the whole Bismarckian uh, tradition of contributory pensions, payroll, tax finance, social insurance is really uh, being, being uh, questioned at this time in history. You do mention the, 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 the strengthening of old age safety nets. Unfortunately, Brazil, which comes out so unsustainably and so generously, is, is a very 
it's a good example, but on the other hand, it's a, it's a very expensive case. It's and it's and it, it has created a number of labor market distortions that are being documented um, that are are not particularly healthy. Um, so I, I, we we need to think a little bit more about the design of the non-contributory pensions. Brazil's non-contributory pension benefit level has been indexed to the minimum wage in that country for the last 20 years, and as a result, it's much higher than it should be, and it's much more much less sustainable than it than it than it normally should be. Um, but that's that's one of the issues that that we need to look at more closely is the design of the non-contributory pension system. The Chilean was mentioned. That's a very um, interesting case of how the non-contributory and the contributory were elegantly brought together um, in the 2008 reform. So in, in the low, in, uh, in low coverage countries, I think we have to look for adequacy, and the, and the report does uh, say this. It's just not emphasized, I think, as much as I would have liked it to be. Um, but as we go forward, as we expand the sample of countries, maybe we can think about these issues uh, more. And I also think we're going to look at different things such as with the old old in the low income countries the, the old old are the rich old basically so i'm not so sure i would concentrate on that and i want actually the labor force participation rates of ghanaian elderly and indian elderly and bangladesh elderly to fall it's they're 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 90 percent for you know the rural elderly in Bangladesh, it's because they have to work until they die. I would prefer that we find some way that they retire. So there are differences in the low income country, uh, higher income country recommendations that I think could be more balanced, particularly if we ever uh, expand the sample to include more of the, of the countries I work in. Um, and I, as I said, uh, more general revenue financing seems to be underway of both health insurance and pensions. And this means a broader tax base and more efficient revenue collection rather than uh, cutting the existing uh, uh, social insurance schemes. We want India to spend 3% of GDP, not 1% of GDP on, on health. Uh, they spend too little. So just as concluding thoughts, um, I think the GAPI uh, <laughs> helps us better understand how countries are dealing with the trade-offs between adequacy and sustainability. Um, the inclusion of the developing countries, I think, is good, and I hope that we can expand it to inc include more uh, developing countries. But I've made a couple of these points about the, the way that we look at the uh, relative poverty numbers and uh, the realities of the low contributory pension and health insurance coverage it means we have to look at things in terms of the policy recommendations a little differently in terms of emphasis than we do for the richer countries with high coverage in these, in these programs. So thank you very much, and congratulations again, Richard. Thanks for having me here. Thank you, Robert. We are slightly over running out of time, so I'm going to wave for now, but hold in reserve the moderator's prerogative to ask the first question and open it up to questions from the audience and uh, a good response. I'll take uh, both questions at the time. Uh, uh, three, I think three questions, and then we'll ask the uh, panel to respond at the same time. If you can identify who you are, Thank you to the panelists for a rich discussion this morning. I am Bethany Brown from HelpAge USA, part of HelpAge International, um, which Robert mentioned in his report. Um, we are actually housed in AARP here in Washington, DC. So it was great to hear a little bit of the, the perspective from, American, from, from an American perspective from Sandy. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about the Global Age Watch Index that HelpAge has put together. Richard Jackson is, of course, a great friend of, of HelpAge, and the work that he does has been such a complement to the work that we do in 65 low- and middle-income countries around the world. Um, the index that we put together is an index of 91 countries using data sets from the World Bank uh, together with some data from the UNFPA. Um, we were looking at four elements, uh, income security, health status, enabling environments, which includes things like uh, access to transportation, and employment and education as sort of the elements of well-being that we should be looking at, that policymakers should be looking at when they're thinking about what it means to grow old. Um, 
And just to, to clarify a little bit about that income indicator, um, we looked at four different weighted portions of it, since that's what we're talking about here. We looked at pension income, um, the poverty rate among older people in each country, um, their relative welfare to the rest of the population, and, their, and GDP per capita. Um, so as we're, as we're thinking about income and what that actually means, it's great to see, to see these sorts of rankings and to be able to tease them apart through, through comparing them. Um, but I think that the, the, uh, the logical outgrowth is, is what are we going to do in terms of policy? What do these things actually mean? Um, and Miles and I were actually at the World Economic Forum Roundtable on Social Protection last week, and that was one of the main topics that we discussed. What, what does it mean to, to grow old well? And this, has, this is a great contribution to, to starting to answer that question. So thanks. Thank you. I'm John Turner, Pension Policy Center, and I'd like to make a comment about the recommendation to increase funding in pensions in poor countries and use China as an example. In China, um, I see Robert is already <laughs> raising his eyebrows. <laughs> in China, uh, they established funded individual account pensions with a 9% contribution rate. Then they proceeded not to segregate the funds and then uh, basically take the money and use it for other purposes. And um, so, I, I, so, I, 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 so that's good that they don't count because they aren't funded. But, uh, but, the, but the point is that uh, the recommendation for funding, uh, you have to take into account the governance capabilities of the countries. And in some countries, funding just doesn't work. And China is an example that the money basically was taken for other purposes and the, uh, they are not funded. And it's uh, actually a, now it's a large liability that the government has to cover. Lou Enoff, uh, thank you all for a great uh, presentation and comments. Uh, I just add to the comment that was here, and I think Robert referred to it, but the, uh, you, you can't count some of the funded pensions that uh, were in Eastern Europe and some other developing countries because they're being gobbled up now into the first pillar schemes, as, as we've seen happening. But my question is, did you look at any countries where gradual retirement was being used? And have you uh, looked at what could happen with improving the collections process for social insurance and uh, even provident funds? Because I think provident funds are being kind of poo-pooed these days, but I think there's some opportunity there. I, I recently had some experience in the South Pacific, and I saw some innovative things happening with provident funds. Those are the questions. Well, I must confess, I've always been, um, I've always been better at uh, defining problems than finding <laughs> solutions. Um, but uh, um, see, to to on, on, on retirement ages, Lou, to, to the extent possible, um, we tried to build in. Uh, estimates of increased labor force participation uh, that might be induced uh, in different countries by um, increases. Yeah, we to the extent possible, we try we tried to estimate increases in labor force participation um, um, d due to changes in in earlier normal retirement ages. As, 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 as you know, raising a retirement age isn't the same thing as raising labor force participation. Um, um, but, but at least we attempted to, 
to, to, to, to, to do that. Um, uh, we, we, we tried to count, uh, um, you know, we, tr we tried to take into account the fact that some ostensibly funded systems are not actually funded. Uh, to, to, to take an example very close to home, state and local pensions in the United States, um, we counted uh, uh, the, our, our, we counted an estimate of the unfunded portion of that actually as PAYGO because that will be born um, unless every municipality in the United States declares bankruptcy by, by future workers and taxpayers. Um, the, the governance issue, I think, is extremely important. It was beyond the scope of, 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 of the index, uh, uh, but I could not concur more um, um, you know, in, its, in, it, in its relevance, and, and funded pension systems do not work well uh, in in some countries, uh, and they certainly don't work well uh, as uh, complete substitutes uh, for um, um, state protection, I would think, in any country. Uh, I, I probably left six things out, but let me pass the, uh, if anybody else has. Anybody else from the panel want to contribute to that? Mm. I would just say, and I, I agree with Robert, I don't think you could uh, uh, come up with a governance index or not one that would be very reliable. I was just thinking what sort of govern governance index would, would, uh, would uh, uh, suffice in, in, in the current setting of the United States. And I, I just, you know, the, 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 uh, the number of years uh, the, the U.S. has not had a proper budget, uh, the number of times Obamacare has uh, been, uh, sorry, uh, an attempt has been made to vote it down, you name it. But what I think is Im important is that these findings have to be, in a sense, interpreted with governance very much in mind. And so, you know, might be more we did look at, uh, in the report. We variety of possible governance indicators uh, from the World Bank and, and the World Economic Forum. And in the end, we, we, we threw up our hands and decided that that was just a step too far. Uh, may, may I just add a word on, on the whole general issue of funding because um, There we go. Um, it, this is in, in particular, I guess, if, 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 I think, Robert, you, you, you raised some issues too, but, but in particular, Sandy. Um, yeah, I mean, the whole question of net versus gross is, you know, it, 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 Sandy's absolutely right. If, if a, a funded pension system does not represent net new savings, um, then that does not uh, uh, boost productivity growth. Um, you know, it, simply taking payroll taxes and channeling them into personal accounts if you're going to borrow to pay for, for, that, for, 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 for that transfer is just financial arbitrage. Um, I, 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 I think there is an additional issue here, though. I mean, that all is true, and I'm going to be corrected by the real economists here in just a moment. But, but that, I think that all is true in, in a closed economy. Um, but if funded pension savings can be invested internationally, um, then uh, uh, you can enjoy the return um, from investing in younger, faster growing, higher productivity economies around the world. Whereas in a PAYGO system, um, um, you know, or, 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 or in a funded system in a closed economy, right? You're, you're, you're a slave to your own demographics. I'm, I'm ready for the <laughs> I'll, I'll just make it brief. I think when the Australian defined contribution system was introduced, the super, I guess it's called, I think the contribution rate initially was about 3%. Um, it, it was subsequently raised to 9%, and now it's going to be raised very gradually to 12% by some date in the future. So I asked myself, okay, the typical worker, uh, say, is now contributing 9% of his or her salary, um, so they're saving 9% of their salary? And, uh, you know, my guess is probably the case that most of it is, is saved. That is that they haven't, uh, you know, they weren't saving that much before, and, and there's not simply a substitution of one kind of saving for another, which would amount to a relabeling of the, uh, financial instruments that, that were purchased. 
And, and I just raise the question. I don't mean to be a smart, you know, uh, a smart aleck about it, but it is, it strikes me as a very basic and important question to, to address. I mean, so, sorry, one more. I mean, what ought to happen if there were, uh, you know, a sudden, sorry, if, if, if a government introduced this kind of system at a fairly high savings rate, sorry, very high contribution rate, and it applied to most of the working force, then strictly speaking, what you ought to see is a big increase in aggregate saving. That is, that is the macro economy should show a big increase in aggregate saving. And if that doesn't occur, then you should, right. you know, wonder what happens. Okay, we'll see two further questions. Uh, We're, we're up, we're Adrian. Come at the back, and then we'll. Okay. Um, <laughs> Want to go first? Uh, hi, my name is Mindy Reiser. I once did some work for ARP. I'm a sociologist and I've worked in the former Soviet Union countries. Once upon a time, Al Gore proposed accounts that people could use for continuing education and training. It got some waves and then disappeared. I'm wondering if anyone on the panel can point to some interesting policies in the wealthier countries that are trying to think about retraining of people who already have some basic level of sophistication, and if so, what the results of such initiatives might be at this point. James Sang, a technical question about the sustainability. Uh, in the models you use, how do you factor in, factor in increases in human capital? I.e., let's say a uh, country X loses 30% of its young due to decreased birth rate, but they increase, imp they increase their average education from sixth grade to ninth grade. Are you ahead, behind, or what? Uh, a very short answer, we don't. Um, That is a limitation uh, of this stylized model, uh, a limitation that I think is acknowledged in the report. And uh, the question uh, around uh, interesting public policies. I'll make a brief comment. I'm, I, I don't know enough to really, um, you know, uh, c c give you a, uh, a detailed list. But, uh, you know, in a way, the, the resolution of this problem or the mitigation of the problem isn't, you know, it, it involves a whole bunch of things. I mean, anything that generally inc increases human capital at least gives us more to play with. The pie is bigger. Um, you know, even a policy like uh, the promotion of financial literacy, conceivably, if it encourages people to save more, might not, but that, that would contribute too. The only point I really wanted to make was that I think the mitigation, you know, what government should be doing is looking into every area of policy and saying, you know, how can we increase saving? Not in a distortive way, but, you know, are, are there ways in which we can increase saving? Encourage people to save more, uh, you know, find uh, un, uh, untapped sources of productivity, uh, increase investment in human capital if, if, if there's obvious underinvestment and so on. Uh, in some ways, I wanted to return to this um, earlier question of the funded pension systems. One problem has been that even in the advanced countries, uh, historically, whenever the, even the pay-as-you-go system started running surpluses, it was impossible to ring fence them. That is, they started being used to finance other, other spending. And I just want to say I agree with uh, Sandy saying, I mean, the main what can you really do to improve uh, your readiness for aging? Uh, we have to increase the size of the economic pie, that, that you need more savings, more investment, less consumption now to pay for uh, re retirement uh, later. And, and one of the problems we, this, with the funded systems we've seen is that uh, they haven't, there hasn't been an increase in savings associated with these, and instead what you had was the, say, the private pension funds were intermediaries that were taking a slice out of the return. So in some ways, you just uh, all you had was uh, 
no increase in savings, and you had a lower replacement rate for some households because of the administrative costs of the, uh, of the pension fund. So I think that's one of the big challenges is how do you reduce administrative costs, especially for these small countries in Europe, how do you, when you have very small systems, how do you get the economies of scale uh, uh, that are necessary? Uh, I think Nick Barr is, I think, a big advocate of this, uh, kind of looks at the U.S. Uh, thrift savings plan as a good model where you can reduce administrative costs, reduce the number of choices people have on the funded pension systems to really help reduce the costs because people are because of, uh, and then one of the insights of behavioral economics, people are not very good about making these choices about their portfolios. You have a well-designed default portfolio uh, and come up with a few simple choices and that can be a way to help reduce these uh, costs of the funded systems. Just put it all in a globally diversified um, life cycle index fund. <laughs> Won't be much help for my pr my <laughs> <laughs> my project sponsor, um, but uh, yeah, that, that that would I think go a long way. Say one more? So, uh, since we've kind of been bashing U.S. government so much uh, <laughs> uh, all day, I just want to say one positive thing. I, I, I've had some interactions with the, the thrift savings plan people, right. and I, I just find that uh, to be a, a very well-run organization with lots of lessons for for, for other countries. Um, and the things that they've been doing, it, down to the record keeping, uh, the, the the information systems, and and the processes that they they're, they're now uh, putting into place, I think it's a it's a real useful example. So some good government goes on here. Great. I'm conscious of the passage of time, so unless there's one very quick question, no, because uh, otherwise uh, people are more than welcome to uh, join us for lunch, during which they can catch up with uh, with each of the speakers. Have any, any outstanding questions asked? But I will just ask uh, Richard now to wrap up, <coughs> after which you're more than welcome to, uh, to join us for a bite. Uh, with, with your indulgence, uh, maybe I'll stand between you and your lunch for. Thank you. With, with your indulgence, I'll stand or sit between you and your lunch for, 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 for just not more than five minutes. I'll try to even be briefer. D just to respond to a few of the very thoughtful and, and, and helpful comments raised by. By, by my colleagues. Um, um, so in uh, uh, reverse order, uh, uh, Robert, you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, I, I agonized to begin with over including emerging markets uh, in, in this index at all. It, it is, the, the, the nature of the problem is different, um, um, a, as I outlined at the beginning of my presentation. It's not just a question of available data. Uh, it, it's not just a data issue. Um, um, often you don't need to measure the same things or indicators that, that mean, appear to mean one thing because that's what they mean in a developed economy, don't mean the same thing. So that, 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 that's a big challenge. And, and there's certainly uh, uh, tremendous room for, for improvement there. I also, um, um, I, perhaps I wrote the policy recommendation section in, in, in haste. Um, and, ag and against a deadline, but, but um, I'm elsewhere uh, on record full-throatedly endorsing and, and emphasizing the crucial importance of non-contributory social pensions uh, uh, in, em in emerging markets. Um, and I should have put that more uh, uh, front and center. So I think we're completely on, on, on the same page uh, uh, there. Um, Yeah, Sandy doesn't recognize the United States in my in my index, and I'm, I'm I actually have there are probably a few people in the audience who 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 who, who don't. Um, there there are a few reasons for that. I mean, wh one reason is that the the index is forward looking. We're not, we're not looking at where countries are today, and and France and Italy may be retirees' paradises, but they're gutting their pension systems. They're putting nothing in their place. So they do dreadfully on our income trend indicators. Um, the, 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 the one indicator where you would expect the United States to do poorly, it does, and, and that's you know, the relative poverty rate of, 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 of the elderly. They're, they're also, it, 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 you can read the technical appendix, but, but, but it also has to do with the way we construct our income measures, which are essentially on a national accounts basis. Um, and, 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 and so include a lot 
a lot more income than is generally reflected in uh, 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 the household income income surveys. But, but no, I, I, I would have preferred the U.S. to come in and lower on the income adequacy index, but try as I might to manipulate <laughs> the data, I couldn't, uh, I, I, could, I couldn't get that to happen. Um, elderly labor force participation. Uh, I mean, the, 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 the question here, and I, 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 I think Sandy and, and, and Robert are, are absolutely right that we have to be cognizant of the fact that you know, not everybody loves their job as much as we do, uh, and not everybody uh, 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 is healthy uh, and disability-free at older ages. Um, um, but the, the, qu the question is, you know, t today, uh, across the gap index countries, between a third and 50 percent of benefits flow to adults in their 60s, and more than a quarter will still in every, at least a quarter, in every developed country still in the year, in the year 2040. And we have to ask ourselves if it's a choice between across the board benefit cuts, which end up impoverishing the oldest old, right, uh, 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 or um, making, making deeper cuts or, or pushing up retirement ages for the younger old and finding some other uh, way of, 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 of supporting those who are unable uh, to work longer. I, I, I think that, that that's. You know, that, 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 that's what I was trying to get at with, with my point. I've probably missed six things worthy of, 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 of response. Just, uh, Benedict, on, uh, on the fiscal adjustment point, um, uh, you're assuming in your projections that countries come back down to a reasonable 60%. We simply, we actually use your projections through 2019, um, um, and then we impose uh, debt neutrality. Uh, in, in, in other words, countries have to uh, raise revenues, or raise or cut, right, taxes and spending, um, um, so that the debt remains unchanged as a share of GDP. But that leaves some countries with a very high debt level, and indeed, they, they probably need, in a Japan or the United States, frankly, much greater fiscal adjustment than we have, than we have built in. Um, and, and the final point on health care. Yeah, health care is most of the growth, um, but I'm not at all convinced that any developed country is going to be very effective at controlling health care spending. Um, um, given uh, uh, in increased technological capability and rising social expectations about care and cure, and I think many countries that have been effective at it, so some of the social democracies in, in, in Europe are becoming less effective. Uh, uh, o over time. And so I guess my point is that what matters is the total resource transfer between young and old, and that it's going to be really hard to control health care spending uh, on, on the elderly. Um, um, the fact that pensions aren't growing as much doesn't mean we sh should ignore pensions. It may mean we need to look more closely at them. Anyway, I, I really thank, thank, thank all of you for participating. Um, um, and let me thank Prudential PLC and Miles again for their support. Uh, uh, I did have some trepidation about following the video uh, with, a, with a presentation, but we don't seem to have had much attrition in the audience, so it can't have been that, that, that grim and dreadful. Um, th th thank you, thank you, gentlemen. And um, we have a buffet lunch uh, awaiting us for anyone who can stay. Thank you.